Thank you for visiting the University of Louisville Journal of Respiratory Infection uh, video section. This is the educational session. And today I'm going to uh, address the issue of the p-value. Usually when we do the analysis of a clinical research study, uh, we are uh, giving the data to the statistician with the most important test is the p-value, and, and we start analyzing the study results evaluating the p-value. Here I want to take one step before and really discuss the idea that when we start looking at the data, first we use our clinical judgment and then we move to the statistical analysis. Now, uh, this idea of, of explaining clinical judgment and the association with the p-value is something that probably you're not going to find in a, in a journal because this is this is an explanation that we've been developing here at the University Pro. It's our own way to, to explain to resident fellows, new uh, members of the clinical research team, how is that the p-value uh, works. Uh, and to do this, I want to probably uh, use a clinical example. And then um, the clinical example goes like this. You are making rounds in the intensive care unit, and a resident say, well, um, the patients that we have here with, let's say, ventilator cell pneumonia, severe infection, uh, that develop sepsis, we are seeing a 50% mortality. Uh, half of the patients die in the unit when they have ventilator cell pneumonia and sepsis. And the residents say, I've been looking at the literature, and I noticed that in community acquired pneumonia, when they are given steroids, patients given steroids, they say, improvement of clinical outcomes and almost uh, decreased mortality has been noticed. Then I would like to look at steroids in patients with ventilator cell pneumonia to see if steroids can decrease mortality. Okay, it's an idea, a research idea, as we have in our research course from idea to publication. This is just the idea. Uh, and then the hypothesis is that steroids may decrease mortality in patients with ventilator cell pneumonia. You mentioned, okay, let's test this idea. You can go to our database that we have of ventilator cell pneumonia in this institution and look at patients that have received steroids for whatever reason versus patients without steroids. The lesson goes, look at the database and come to you with the initial results. And let's say that, say, well, I was able to review eight patients. And uh, ventilator cell pneumonia, there are eight patients. And from these eight patients, there are uh, four patients that have uh, steroids negative, and four patients that have steroids positive. The patient was were treated with steroids. And then, as always, we do the, the two by two table and figure out what happened with the death in these patients. Then, from these uh, four patients in each uh, group, uh, then we figure out how many patients are going to be dead and how many patients are going to be alive. Well, from the four patients, without steroids, that would be the quote-unquote standard of practice, we notice that two patients are dead and two patients are alive. For the four patients that receive steroids, steroid positive, in the database, uh, one patient died and three patients are alive. And this is the data. You look at this data, just look at this, well, um, the resident may be excited because there is a decreased mortality with steroids, but of course you're going to say, well, this data is really unimpressive. We have nothing here yet because uh, if we were to check the next patient with steroids die, really is almost the same that non-steroids. At the same time, there's nothing here, but we just need to collect more data. Um, the resident goes back, look at the database further, and now comes to you with uh, now 16 patients 
with ventilator cell pneumonia in your unit. We have eight patients with steroids negative and eight patients with steroids positive. Now, what are the results in this group of patients? We go back to patients that are going to be dead versus patients that are going to be alive. And in the standard of practice, if we have four patients dead, four patients alive. Well, yes, the 50% mortality that we tend to see in our intensive care unit. But now in the patient that were treated with steroids in the database, a death is one death and seven patients are alive. And you look at this data, here you say you have nothing because the possibility of this due to chance is very high. Now here, this data is really interesting. We may have something here, just one, then uh, if I keep adding patients, even if you have one or two that are going to go into the death, still seems to be that there is an imbalance here. Um, this is interesting. You say, well, what about if we look at more patients? And the next time that the residents come to you, double the number of patients to 32 patients, and now what you have here is 16 patients in your database. They have steroids negative, and 16 patients that have steroids positive. Now, what happens when you have 32 patients in your study, and what may be the results there of death versus alive? Well, um, in patients with a standard of practice, let's assume that we still maintain the 50% mortality. That is the standard the approach. But in these 16 patients that were given steroids, the results indicate one dead, 15 alive. Now, they show you this, and you said, wait a minute. This is unbelievable. This is impressive. Okay, we have something here. We need to, we definitely need to do a prospective study and look at the steroids. And now, we have not still involved our statistician. We have not done any mathematical modeling. This is just all clinical judgment. But we can see how do we move from this data to this data to this data. Another thing that, that essentially what we are doing in using our clinical judgment, every time that the resident comes with this data, really mentally, we are looking at the possibility that, that if he give us eight patients, then we go back and mentally probably we are looking at dead and alive. If there are four patients, standard of practice is supposed to be two and two. And really the four patients with steroids, mentally we are thinking, well, yeah, this is going to be still two and two, because steroids probably, they are doing nothing. Then this is what I expect. This is what I obtain. And one on three versus two and two, it's not a big deal, and we say we have nothing. In this case, with 16 patients, if we expect dead and alive, really, eight patients, we still have four and four, but for the eight patients with steroids, mentally, I still have four and four. This is, essentially, steroid has no effect. But now instead of four and four, I get one and seven. This is interesting. I may have something here, and now you start saying, well, let's look into this. But in this one, really what we're having in our mind, 
of dead or alive, we know that this is supposed to be A and A. If a steroid has no activity in real life, this is supposed to be 8 and 8. But instead of 8 and 8, I get 1 and 15. The numbers are really impressive. Now, all this has been clinical judgment. Then essentially, when we say to a resident, oh, you think that steroids decrease mortality? Well, what you're saying is just prove it to me. Give me some data for me to believe you that your idea, your hypothesis, really has anything to do with my patients in the unit. Then this is what you try to disprove. You're trying to disprove that because this is your idea. Your idea in your mind is that steroids are doing nothing. All this is clinical judgment. We have not used a single mathematical modeling. Now, we give this data to the statistician or we do the calculation and we say, okay, well, <clears throat> if this were to be the case, steroid has no activity, and I get these results, one on three, what is the possibility that these results are really due to chance? Because this is what I consider to be the truth. And the statistician will say, well, the possibility here is probably 50%. I said, well, yes, because to me, this was nothing, 50%, that this is just chance. Now, when I get here, that the results look interesting, if this were to be the truth, what are the possibility that I want to get these results just due to chance? Well, the possibility here, the statistician will tell you, is 10%. And this is, you see, this you look at this as some interesting results, the possibility of chance decrease from 50% to 10%. And now you give these numbers to the statistician and say, if this were to be the case in real life, what is the possibility that I want to get these results just by chance? And he will tell you this is 1%. Then you go from 10% to 1%. And this is when you are saying these results are impressive. Now, let's translate this into the, the way that they are going to give you these results is with the results of the p-value. Then, this result, of the, because we know that the p-value goes from 0 to 1. Then, the results of this p-value will be 0.5. That is the 50%. The result for this p-value will be 0.1. That is the 10%. And the result for this p-value will be 0.01. And we all recognize that in when we look at mathematics and we look at the p-value, there is this value here, 0.05, that below this value, we call it the p-value is statistically significant. But you can see that essentially what the mathematics and the p-value is doing is really putting an objective evidence of what we in clinical practice, in our clinical judgment, we are already seeing there. Because here, without I apply any statistics, I say you have nothing here. And the p-value is 0.5. 50% of this is due to chance. <laughs> Nothing. When the resident brings you these results, you say, wow, this is interesting. We may have something here. And you see that these interesting values related to a p-value of 0.1. 10% that this is due to chance if this were to be the case in real life. Interesting, but not there yet. But when you get these results, that you say, these results, you say, wow, this is impressive. The clinical judgment, impressive, p-value less than 0.05. Then you see the correlation of the p-value what we do in clinical practice. 
To finish this short video, I want to mention, I want to emphasize that at no point in this presentation I mentioned that the hypothesis of the resident is true or false based on my clinical judgment or the results of the p-value. Because really, with the p-value, the only thing is that we are saying that, well, is the possibility that essentially, let me also mention that, that this, that I'm in my mind, I say this is what I want to, to essentially reject. I consider that this is the case. Prove me to me, prove me that this is not the case. This in a statistics is the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no value. The resident said, steroids are going to decrease mortality. This is his hypothesis. This is the hypothesis that steroids are not decreasing mortality. The null hypothesis. As the p-value decreases, I'm able to reject the null hypothesis, and then I accept the study hypothesis. But the problem, one of the big confusions of p-value, is that people believe that if you have a low p-value, essentially the null hypothesis is false. No, we're not talking here that this is false or this is true. We are talking that we reject this and we accept this. Remember, using math, you can never prove that something is true or false. Then, essentially, at the end of the day, even with these values, that is impressive, and I rejected the null hypothesis, even at this level, 0 0.1, I, don't, I cannot say that the null hypothesis is false and the resident hypothesis is true. I just say that I have enough evidence here that if this were to be the case in real life, the possibility of getting these results, if this were to be the case, just by chance, is 1%. Or well, it's good enough that probably every one of the patients in my unit is going to get steroids if they have BAP and sepsis. Now, there are, does this mean that the, this in real life is false? I still don't know, because this is math. And essentially, in this uh, presentation, I'll give you an overview of how do I uh, explain the, the, the beginning of the p-value explanation to, to newcomers into clinical research to see that as you get experience, you start analyzing data, you apply your clinical judgment, and really the p-value is there to give a quantification, mathematical quantification, to something that we already expect as we start analyzing the data. With this, thank you very much for your attention, and see you next time.